Hello everyone, welcome to Hobo Radio. So sit down, kick your feet up, and enjoy some radio, the old time era, and I hope you'll like and subscribe. Twenty place preaching, Sergeant Waters. Well, who are you, the watchman? What they break into? Did you see the thieves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's missing? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah. Wait right at the gate there so you can show them where it is. Okay. Yeah. 21st Precinct, transcribed. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was Sunday and things were quiet in the precinct. During the last few weeks, we had received several complaints from various churches about boys playing in nearby streets in a boisterous manner and disturbing the services. I had given instructions at the turnout for the men on post and in sector cars to correct this situation by warning the boys to play more quietly or move their games to other locations. Later, during the course of patrol, I went to the vicinity of every church in the precinct to observe whether the conditions had been corrected. En route down 2nd Avenue, I saw sector car number one, the sergeant's car, and the detective squad car of the 21st squad parked outside the fence around a new construction project on which excavation had started about two weeks before. I instructed my operator to pull in. As I got out of the car and headed for a gate in the fence, I saw Sergeant Waters also walking toward the gate from a call box on the opposite corner. Sergeant? Hello, Captain. What have we got? In here, Captain. Oh, watch your step. We've had a burglary in a tool shack down there. Oh, that's a pretty deep hole they dug. Yes, sir. And they've got to go still deeper. Well, what have we got? There was a call from the watchman. Uh, see that wooden shack way down there at the bottom? Yeah. That's what was broken into. And it's interesting to me how they do this. They dig it all out except for this ramp for the trucks to get in and out. Then that uh, steam shovel backs up here, digging up the ramp behind it. Well, what was stolen, Sergeant? It was a good haul. A what? Eleven sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, watch your step here, Captain. These planks are kind of rough. The heavy trucks chew them up. Where are the detectives? Lieutenant King of Italia here, Captain. Oh. A watchman rang into the station house from a call box when he discovered the theft. Lieutenant Gorman notified the detectives. Yeah. I just spoke to Lute uh, Lieutenant Gorman again and told him what it looked like. Where is it? That shack there? Yes, sir. This is some hole, you know. And these engineers, they figure it out down to the fraction of an inch. Yeah. Even when they got to blast out all this rock, they save it down over here. Oh, I, uh... I guess they're all in the shack, Captain. Yeah, I guess so. You see, uh, they hacked the lock right off the door. Everything was locked up. That's how they got in. That's right, Lieutenant, when I got back. Hello, Matt. Captain, this is Bernard Curley, the watchman on the job here. The sergeant tells me they got 11 sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Yes, sir, that's what they got. This is Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. I'm pleased to meet you, Captain. I was in the job myself. 
Oh, were you? Yes, sir. I was in the old 12th precinct. I put my papers in 1944. Curly, you say? Yes, sir. I spell it K-E-R-L-Y. Oh. Well, how do you know exactly that it was 11 sticks of dynamite and 8 blasting caps, Curly? Well, we've got to keep close track of these things around here, the explosives, you know. Yeah. Now, you see this inventory packed up here? Right here on the wall? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's company rules. When a fresh case is cracked open, every stick and every cap's got to be accounted for. It's scratched off the inventory as it's used. And a new case can't be brought in from the company office until the last case is entirely gone. Uh Uh-huh. So when they finished work here Friday night, they had 11 sticks and 8 caps left over. They were locked up in here. Where? Right here. Loose on the shelf? Well, the shack was locked. Locked didn't do much good, did it? I guess we'll have to get a new one. What time do you think this happened? I know what time it happened. It happened from between a quarter to twelve and a quarter after. She left the premises a quarter of. Down the street to a lunch and that. To get sandwiches to bring back here. Are you permitted to leave? Well, company rules say we can take a half an hour off for lunch or dinner if we work in daytime. That is, on Saturday, Sunday, or holidays. If we're working nights, we've got to bring our meal with us. That's the rules of this company. And you left here at a quarter to twelve? Uh, yes, sir. The shack wasn't broken into then? No, sir. I made my rounds immediately before I left. That's another rule. The shack wasn't disturbed. Did you see anyone suspicious hanging around the premises this morning? No, Lieutenant. I didn't see a soul. And when did you discover the theft? As soon as I came back. I opened up the gate at the top of the ramp. You know, that's just where you came in up there. Yeah. And I could see down here that this door to the shack was standing wide open. Well, I came on down. I thought whoever it was might still be inside here. But they were gone. Then I went up to the street and I walked over to the call box and rang into the station house. I talked to the desk officer there, uh, Lieutenant uh, Gorman. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman, yes, sir. Well, it wasn't a couple of minutes before the officers got here. Did they use a lot of dynamite on this job here? <laughs> a lot of dynamite. We've been blasting for ten days. You saw no sign of these thieves at all when you were coming back? Uh, no, sir. They were gone. Did you take a look around, Matt? They might have been scared off by his coming back and hidden the stuff on the premises. I, I doubt it. Well, they might have, Captain. Sergeant Tally Woods. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Put up in the teams of two. Make a thorough search around. Go over the power shovel, do all the equipment behind that lumber, every place. Yes, sir. We can see if they dropped any of the stuff or left any physical evidence of their presence. Mr. Curley, yeah? you go with the sergeant. Okay. I ought to notify my boss, don't you think? You can do that as soon as you get through. Come on, Mr. Curley. Yo, Matt. Come here over there. Matt. Come on over here. Yes, Captain. It didn't take much to get this lock off, did it? No, sir. Not much. One good pull on whatever they used for a jimmy, and the screws came right out of the wood. Yeah. The shack is probably 30 years old. They move it around from job to job. Come on inside a second, Matt. Yes, sir. That can cause a lot of trouble. Eleven sticks of dynamite and eight blasting caps. Uh, you're telling me. But the boys that got it knew what they were after, I'm sure. They know how to handle it. Safe burglars? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like to me. They'll take it and boil it down to nitroglycerin and use it to shoot a safe someplace. Been a long time since I've heard of anyone using nitro to shoot a safe. Yeah, I know. They ought to make it easier to spot them. As soon as we get back to the station house, I'll ring down to the safe and loft squad and tell them what we've got. Burglars today rip a safe or cut it open, don't they? Well, generally, yes, sir. But the safe and law squad might know of some old timer that's been released lately. You ought to be able to come up with something on this. Matt, if they were safe burglars, why didn't they take this stuff? Here's a tank full of acetylene, oxygen, cutting torch. Well, this is all made to order for safe burglars. Why didn't they take it? Well, Captain, if a guy likes a rare steak, you just can't talk him into pork chops. Well done. The theft of the dynamite and blasting caps from this construction job did, as Lieutenant King suggested, look like the work of safe burglars, although the use of nitroglycerin to blow up a safe is now infrequent. A thorough search of the entire site of the excavation by patrolmen and detectives revealed nothing. Meanwhile, I got a call from the 19th Precinct informing me that a patrolman had been slightly injured while disarming a youthful offender carrying a switchblade knife. 
The patrolman had been taken to Bellevue Hospital, and as senior officer on duty in the 6th Division, I was required to conduct an investigation of the occurrence. I went to Bellevue and got the details of the case from the officer who suffered a long gash on his right hand. I entered the results of my investigation in the blotter at the 19th Precinct and then returned to the 21st, where Sergeant Leo F. Rosen was on telephone switchboard duty and Lieutenant Patrick Gorman was desk officer. I walked around behind the desk and signed the blotter. Hello, Captain. Sergeant. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Rosen. Hello, Red. Yes, sir. Well, what's doing? Nice, quiet Sunday afternoon. That's good. How's that cup that was hurt? Oh, not too bad. He's got a nasty cut on his right hand, straight across the palm. Where he grabbed the open blade? Yep. Doctor had to take seven stitches in it. That can be kind of rough, an injury to the hand like that. Yeah. You know, there's about nine million nerves and tendons and bones and blood vessels come together in the hand. It'd be some job getting them all straightened out. Well, he was able to move all his fingers okay. Doctor said that was a good sign. Yeah, that is a good sign. You know, a doctor told me once that the hand is just about as complicated as any part of the body. You wouldn't figure that, would you, Captain? Well, I can see where it would be. Well, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, anything turn up on the theft of that dynamite? Uh, no, sir, nothing yet. Uh, but there's Matt King. Maybe he's got a line by now. Yeah, he may have. Matt? Hello, Captain. Anything on that dynamite test? No, sir, not yet. You know, that's got me plenty worried. Got me worried, too, Captain. I'll tell you why. I... Excuse me, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. The tally's ringing down for you. Want to be better before you go out. All right. You want to take it in my office, Matt? Yeah, thanks. I'll take it in the captain's office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Tally is carrying the squeal on this. You might have something. Go ahead. Help yourself. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Yeah, B. Yeah, what'd they say? Hmm. Well, who was it you talked to? Who? Well, you ought to know. Yeah, all right. Just keep at it. Vitaly spoke to one of the men down at the Safe and Lost Squad. Yeah? Vitaly says they know of no one around who's using nitro to blow a safe. Hadn't had a case like that in a couple of years. Have there been any penitentiary releases? None they know of. We're checking into it. Well, makes it kind of rough going. Yet. You know what I think, man? What? I don't think it was safe burglars at all that broke into that shack. I think it was a bunch of kids. I don't know, Captain. It was timed out just right. They knew when the watchman left. They knew when he got back. They got in, got the stuff, and got out. All in a half an hour. Well, that may be so, Matt, but... Oh, excuse me. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Lieutenant Gorman, Captain. Yes, Red. A call just came over the air, Captain. An explosion on a vacant lot over New York Avenue. What kind of explosion? The call didn't say, Captain, but there must be at least one person injured. It came over ambulance responding. All right. Get a car to take me over there right away. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, I think we've found the dynamite. Yeah? But I think we found it a little late. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct, I'm Captain Kennelly. While I waited for the car to come by the house for me, the first officer to arrive on the scene rang into the station house, reporting that the explosion in the vacant lot, the site of a recently wrecked tenement, was apparently caused by the detonation of blasting caps. An unidentified boy, who appeared to be between the ages of 12 and 15, had been injured by the blast. Within another two minutes, sector car number two arrived at the station house. I got into the car and was driven to the scene of the occurrence with siren wide open. As we pulled into the block, I could see that a fair-sized crowd had gathered on the sidewalk and were being kept back by two of the patrolmen already on the job. The ambulance had not yet arrived. All right. 
get on the job. Help keep those people back. All right. All right. Police officer. Coming through there. Coming through. Sergeant. Hello, Captain. Well, I uh, guess we know who got the dynamite. Yeah. I guess we do. He looks pretty bad, doesn't he? Yes, sir. Has he been conscious at all? No, sir. Awful bad. You know who the boy is? There's no identification in his pockets, Captain. Who, uh, want to take a look over here? Yeah. Apparently, he was playing around with the blasting caps. Those two sticks of dynamite were right here where they're laying. It's lucky he didn't have them close enough to be set off when the caps went. He'd be just for sure. How many caps went, you know? There's no telling. So, uh, here's the ambulance. Yeah. A man who lives on the second floor of that building there, he was down here. He said he was looking out the window before and saw three boys sitting out here in the middle of the lot. Three? Yes, sir, three. Said they had something. He didn't know what it was. Then a little while later, two of them were gone, he said, and there was just this one left. Mm -hmm. Man went back into his flat to do something, and a few minutes later he heard this explosion out on the lot. Did he recognize any of the boys? No, sir. He didn't think they were from this block. Uh, all right, you men. Give him a hand. Help them bring that stretcher back here. Uh, Did uh, anybody around say they knew the boys, Sergeant? Nobody we've talked to yet. All right. You better get those explosives into the station house. Yes, sir. I told Farrell to stay right with them. Good. All right. Bring it right over here, please. Hello, Doctor. Captain. All right, open up that stretch of act alive. What happened to him? He was playing with some blasting caps. Was he? Sergeant, can you give me a hand here a minute? Sure. I'd like to put him on his right side for just a second. All right. Uh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll tell you when. Okay. Easy now. All right. With me. Yeah. Now. Uh, Easy. Can you hold him there? Sure. That's good. That's fine. Hold him. Just, just hold him. I'm holding him, Doctor. Good. Fine. All right. Let him rest back now. Okay. Easy. Uh, that boy is seriously hurt, Captain. Will he be all right, do you know? We'll find out when we get him admitted to the hospital. What did you say he was playing with? Blasting, cap? Yes. Yeah. They never learn, do they? I hope this one does. The ambulance surgeon, assisted by the ambulance attendant and police officers, placed the injured boy on the stretcher. Meanwhile, detectives of the 21st Squad arrived on the scene to begin their investigation. After I left the scene of the occurrence, I continued on patrol until a few minutes after 2 p.m. when I instructed the operator of my car to drive to the emergency entrance to Beth David Hospital. I got out of the car, walked through the emergency room, past the admitting office, and down the corridor to the place I was told I could find Dr. Margaret Westphal. Hello, Doctor. Captain. How's the boy? Not so good. Will you be able to do anything? He's in there, emergency surgery. Uh-huh. Going back to X-ray, we'll make some pictures. He's in bad shape. Hmm? Well, the blast tore a hole in his chest. We called in our chief thoracic surgery. It's on the way. In the meantime, we're giving him plasma. Do you need any whole blood? We don't know yet. Every man in the precinct is typed. I think we could get some volunteers over here on a few minutes' notice. Thanks a lot, Captain. We'll see. All right, you just let me know. I will. Um, Lieutenant from your precinct is here. A detective. Lieutenant King? Yes, Lieutenant King. He's right back there. When did he get here? A few minutes ago. 
told me he knows who the boy is. Oh, does he? That's what he says. In here. Thank you, Doctor. Hello, Matt. Captain. I understand you've got an identification. Well, it's a tentative identification. Vitaly ran it down. We think the boy's name is Frank Harrod. He lives near where the stuff was stolen. They ought to be more careful about the way that dangerous material was left around. Well, Doctor, I don't see how they could have been more careful. It was locked up in a tool shed in the middle of an excavation surrounded by an eight-foot fence. Well, I have to be angry at something. I think I'd better get back to it. All right. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Uh, shall I leave this open? Yes, please. All right. Has the family been notified, ma'am? According to the neighbors, the boy's got no mother. The father wasn't around the flat. Vitaly is trying to run him down. Are you sure that's the boy? As sure as we can be at the moment. The doctor got me these clothes he was wearing. If Vitaly brings the father down, he can look at the clothes first. What about the other nine sticks of dynamite in the rest of the blasting camp? We're trying to locate them. A neighbor over where the boy got hurt said there were two others with him earlier. You get a line on them? Well, we know that they were up to this boy's flat this morning while the father was there. You ought to know who they are. Who found that out? Vitaly? Yes, sir. The old man lives on the first floor of the building. He said he saw the three boys go out at the same time the father did. He said the father acted very friendly to the other boys. He'd seen them all around there before. You haven't been able to find out who they were from any other source, have you, man? No, oh, not yet, Captain. Well, we'd better find out soon. There's still nine sticks of that dynamite missing. We don't know how many percussion caps. No, we don't. Yeah, these kids. They sure can get themselves in a mess. Excuse me, uh, Lieutenant King? Yes? Yeah. Uh, there's a detective at Tali and another man outside. Oh, all right. I didn't want to send them back here until I got your old king. It's okay. All right, I'll send them back. wonder where Veet found him. Maybe he came home. How old is the boy? You know for sure? Oh, not for sure. I think about 14. That's what the neighbors say. Hmm. 14. What are we going to do with these kids, Captain? is isn't a cop's job to straighten them out. Why do they hang it on us? And the trouble is, Matt, doesn't get to us until somebody else has already missed the boat. Hmm. Right back there, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Come in, V. Oh, Lieutenant. Captain. Vitale. This is Mr. Carl Harris. Captain Kennelly. Mr. Harris. Hi. And Lieutenant King. Hi. You sure it's Frank they got in there? Pretty sure, Mr. Harris. You shut the door, V. Yep. Well, uh, how is he? Is he all right? They've got him over there in the operating room. They're waiting for the sergeant. What surgeon? I hope he's not going to cost an arm and a leg. I'm not made of money, you know. Let's not worry about it now. Are, uh, are these Frank's clothes and Paris? Are these? Yeah. Yeah, here's the, the, those are his pants. I recognize the pants. Is it, who, who is this surgeon, anyway? What, what is he going to operate for? The detective Vitale told you what happened, didn't he? I told him, Lieutenant, yes. Those caps exploded against his chest. It's a chest surgeon that's coming. Oh. That's pretty bad, huh? Yes. Well, how bad is it, Lieutenant? How bad, Captain? Bad enough. Mr. Harrod, you know where Frank got hold of that stuff? No, the detective told me he, he broke into a construction shack. That's right. Well, what kind of proof he got? He's got no proof he broke into anything. Nobody saw him. The stuff he stole blew up and almost killed him. That's proof enough, isn't it? For you, maybe not for me. Mr. Harrod, do you think you ought to notify Frank's mother? How can I notify her? I don't know where she is. Ran off three years ago, let me hold the sack with the kid. He's your boy, isn't he? Yeah, you see, he's, he's my boy, but I got to work for a living. I got, I got no time to raise him. That should have been his mother's job. You don't know where to find him? No, sir. You ever hear anything from her? You kidding? I... Uh, listen, give it to me straight now. Now, how is he? He's not not good, huh? Not good, no. Who were the two boys he was with this morning? What do you want to know that? There's still nine sticks of dynamite missing and probably most of the blasting caps. Who were they? How should I know who they are? 
We were told that they were at your flat this morning with Frank. They'd been there often. You know them all. Now, look, I'm not turning in any kids. If you want them, go and find them. Mr. Harrod, the same thing is liable to happen to them as happened to Frank. Well, that's not my worry. Supposing it happened to one of them and Frank was running around with explosives, you'd want it cleared up fast, wouldn't you? I don't know. Never all kids all, all down in that court. No, I, I, I'd take the chance on, on, on Frank handling himself okay. He sure handled himself fine, didn't he? Now, look, find out for yourself. I, I don't want to get involved in this any more than I am already. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Harrod. It's not just those other two boys that are involved. They're liable to try something with that stuff. They're liable to hurt some other people. Now, who are they and where can we find them? Go find them yourself. It's not my responsibility. Isn't it? You just think it isn't. It isn't. You can't make it mine. Come in. Now, I'm not going to let you... Excuse me. Captain, can I see you out here a minute? Yeah, sure. You can't, you can't make this my responsibility. Yes, Doctor? Is that the boy's father? Yes. Yeah. I've got bad news, Captain. The boy died. Oh. The whole thoracic cavity was badly damaged. Both lungs, the heart, he's hemorrhaging. There really wasn't much that could have been done. No. Not after he stole the explosives. What's the father's name? Harrod. Carl Harrod. Well. Look, Doctor, this is a police case. We can notify him. No. No, thank you, Captain. I won't accomplish anything. Won't accomplish anything except to get Frank in bad with his friends when he gets out of here. There's one thing I, I don't want to do with my kid. That's, that's peg him as a rat. Rat on his friends. You know. Mr. Harrod, uh, this is Dr. Westall. That's all I got to say, Captain. Dr. Who? Dr. Westall. Oh, I'm very pleased to meet you. Uh, you're the one who's been taking care of Frank. Yes. Well, listen, uh, what is all this about uh, About a surgeon being called in? I don't want any surgeon called in unless I, I'm, I'm consulted first. If he needs to be operated all right, but I, I want to have the privilege, you know, of, of talking it over first. He doesn't need the surgeon, Mr. Harris. Well, that's, that's very good to hear. That's... Wait a minute. Listen, he, he, he didn't die. Yes, he did, Mr. Harris. Five minutes ago. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Better sit down. Mr. All right, right. That's all right. I'm all right. You'd better. Okay. You think I'm better? Hurt? Yeah. I, I, I knew he was hurt bad, but I didn't think he died. I, I didn't think it. He's 14 years old. 14. Why don't you gentlemen wait outside? No, no, don't, don't go. I'll stay. No, don't go. I, I want to give them the name for the other boys. I, I want to give them to you. I, I'm sorry. I'll be all right. I, I'll be all right in a minute here. We'll wait outside. You better, yes. Swanty. Yes. No, don't go away. I want to talk to you. We'll be right outside. I was wrong about him. I thought he was pretty hard. He was, man. I just wish it hadn't taken so much to soften him up. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. You're shooting where? Talking to the phone, will you? Where's the shooting? Lexington and what? And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed the factual account of the way the police worked in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Elaine Ross, Bill Smith, Lynn Cook, Santa Sortega, and Bill Zuckett. 
Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. George Bryan speaking. Mm-hmm.